that would be in English. Mm, okay. Uh, okay, so we have uh, the pleasure today of having uh, Javier Ballesteros Paredes, uh, who has already a long trajectory uh, of, in astronomy. He actually- I'm has, not that old. <laughs> No, 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 it's long already. <laughs> and uh, so I'm proud to say that he was my first grad student and he got his PhD in 1999 at the Institute of Astronomy working with me. And uh, we're really proud that he is the personality, you know, the big uh, name in, in, in the field of uh, star formation that he is now. He, uh, after that, well, first he did a pre doc stay at the CFA while he was still a grad student. Uh, and he worked with Lee Hartman at that time uh, for a year. Then he finished his PhD and then he went on to do a postdoc uh, with Mordecai McLow at the uh, American Museum for Natural History. And then since then he returned to, uh, to the then CRIA. And now today he is very well known uh, for, in particular for some papers, one of which is I have heard from another student in a meeting that he was, uh, he liked very much Javier's paper on six myths on the uh, Vero theorem. So that, that was good to hear. So Javier is an expert on um, uh, the Vero theorem in most of styles and also on comparing uh, observational data to numerical simulations. And uh, he will be talking to us about that and why the molecular clouds are gravitationally dominated, which by the way, is a hot topic. Uh, and, and the so, Javier. Okay, so this talk was uh, supposed to be given by Laura Ramirez Galeano. She was my student uh, uh, during her uh, bachelor. Um, but unfortunately, she, she couldn't make it. Uh, so, I'm giving her talk. Uh, and, well, um, the idea, the original idea of this work was to. Um, to somehow answer this other paper uh, by Claire Dobbs, uh, in, where she published in 2011 uh, a, a, paper, a, a paper arguing that molecular class, uh, clouds are mostly not gravitationally bound. So since we were uh, finding the opposite uh, result, uh, that's why we, we, we decided to work on this. So for instance, uh, back in 2001, uh, as Enrique said, I, I spent that. Uh, sometimes with, with Lee Hartman working uh, the, in, in, at the CFA in, in Harvard. Um, and uh, what we, uh, the main result there uh, after my, my work there was that molecular clouds, as they are formed uh, from, from the H1, they rapidly become gravitationally bound and then collapse and then form stars. And the stars also disperse the clouds very rapidly. This was the main result of that, of that paper back then. And since then, since then uh, different papers have come out. Uh, I'm just going to, to mention a few ones here. Um, the, the, and the point is that uh, when you try to build up a molecular cloud from the diffuse uh, H1, as the cloud, uh, as, the, as the H1 collide, uh, streams, uh, the different streams collide, they compress and they cool very rapidly. And that's why they become gravitationally bound. Uh, so we were building uh, clouds, um, and what we found is that indeed, yes, uh, the, the the clouds get uh, get collapse, uh, get get gravitational bound and collapse very fast. So there are many, many different papers uh, by by us, by the group of Enrique and myself, by the group of uh, Lee Hartman and Fabian Heitch. Uh, I also made some collaborations with them, um, and at some point we actually found that. Even the what what it's called the supersonic turbulent motions can have a gravitational origin. So uh, as the cloud uh, contracts, what you measure as supersonic turbulent motions can be not the result of of some turbulence trying to support the cloud, but instead of the the same turbulent motions within the cloud, but the cloud is collapsing, is contracting. So. Uh, as a summary, uh, in 2019, we published a paper uh, led by Enrique. Uh, so uh, here we somehow summarize the whole scenario. Um, here, these are just few references, but there are much more uh, uh, references published by us and, and also by other groups which have started to contribute somehow also. 
On the other hand, as I told, already told you, Claire Dobbs uh, had published a detailed paper uh, why most molecular clouds are not gravitationally bound. This is, I believe, this is the common belief of, of, of the community. Is, uh, most people believe that clouds are supported by turbulence. Um, so for instance, Paolo Paduan suggests that turbulence produced by supernova explosions in the ISM support the clouds and you, you get a star formation only when different, current, uh, different streams from, from the supernova explosions converge into a point and then you have enough mass to collapse and form a star. Um, but the, these, the, those are not the only ones. Of course, there are much more. Uh, Mark Conholz has been uh, insisting also in that picture that even, even a bound cluster like the Orion Nebula cluster are formed within a supported cloud uh, that survives many triple times. And finally, uh, I think that uh, Neil Evans and collaborators uh, have also measured or trying to, to, to show that that at least the most diffuse parts of the molecular clouds are not gravitationally bound, but only the densest parts of the molecular clouds. So the debate is, is right there. Uh, the this light paper is, is, um, has been published in uh, last year, 2021. By the way, if some one of you want to interrupt and ask something, please feel free. I think that with the pandemic, we lost that. Uh, we, here at Korea, we have this, uh, we were very used to to start asking when the, as, as the speaker was talking. And I think that that interaction makes the, 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 the talk much more, uh, much more nice. No? So feel free to interrupt any, any time, even, even people online. So uh, are the clouds really bound? Uh, so that, that, that will be the, 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 main, the main question. And also how relevant could be the galactic tides and the tides uh, due to the different ingredients of the around the clouds, no? Uh, so for that matter, um, Laura Ramirez Galeano started uh, her work uh, here. She was uh, here at the Institute uh, uh, because uh, we have this uh, Programa de Verano uh, back in 2018. Uh, I believe that in 2020, it was interrupted because of the pandemic. And unfortunately this year we couldn't uh, find the uh, resources. So, uh, they, they have no financial support for this day, for, for, for this year. But I'm going to take out this out because, sorry, <laughs> if, if nobody minds. Thank you. So I believe that uh, the result of her work uh, became a paper. So I believe that this is a strong argument to, to, to request the authorities that we should continue with this program. I think it's, it's very good. She was coming from the University of Antioquia, Antioquia in Colombia. And now she's working in, in the University of uh, uh, Geneva in, in Italy, sorry, in, in uh, Switzerland. So uh, one of, the, of my crowd, uh, co-authors is not young Jane Arthur, it's Rowan Smith. <laughs> <laughs> they are very familiar, very similar, but it's Rowan Smith. She's working in the University of Manchester and uh, she had these beautiful simulations made with uh, Arepo, uh, this, uh, this code that has an irregular mesh uh, uh, that is adapting all the time. Uh, she had a, what she called the cloud factor simulation. So they simulate a whole galaxy and within that galaxy, they put all the ingredients. I will, I will discuss these ingredients later um, uh, in, the, in the galaxy and then they analyze what, what happens. So we use those simulations. Vianney uh, was also co-author. Uh, she made part of the analysis of the results, as, as well as Lara. Um, and Manuel Zamora Aviles, uh, who is working at the, at the INAOE. And uh, as you can see from the picture, uh, she's expert on the, uh, making the tessellations on, on the field because Arepo is working with tessellations. And this is important because since Arepo has this irregular grid, it becomes important to know how to compute the different forces, the fluxes between the, of that between one cell and the other, and so on and so forth. So those are the collaborators. And of course, myself, uh, who I am wearing a mandil here, which <laughs> says nothing about me. <laughs> I, I was acting like a glue. This is not a baby bottle. Uh, it's, it's a glue. So, um, so the idea, part of the idea was how relevant are the tides, no? So I, I, 
affecting the, 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 the molecular clouds. So if you look at different galaxies, uh, you can see that indeed the, the, the galaxies have different shapes, the different morphologies, and somehow one is tempted to say that tides should affect the, the molecular clouds, no? Otherwise, why one, one, one galaxy has this shape and, and the other the other one? No? So uh, this is tentative. We made a first work, a simple work in, back in 2009, uh, and we made a toy model. So we used the Allen and Santillan 92 model for the galaxy potential. We also use uh, Barbara Pichardo's uh, spar alarms. And uh, what we found here with these toy uh, clouds uh, is that galactic uh, stresses can be relevant for computing the energetics of the clouds. So this is what is shown in this, in this image. Uh, I'm not going to enter in, in detail. So the, the result is that basically that galactic stresses can be relevant. However, in this result, part of the result de depend upon different char characteristics of the clouds, but in particular, the orientation of the clouds. So it's not the same to have a cloud oriented along the spar alarm or orient oriented radially. If it's oriented radially, then the, um, the stresses are larger. And then of course, the tidal distribution can be larger. If it's oriented parallel, then the compressive stresses can be larger. So it depends on the orientation of the cloud, what you get uh, in this case. But this was a simple model uh, of the galaxy and a simple model of the spar alarms and a simple model of, 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 the, of the clouds. So uh, for, the, for this work uh, with Lara, we decided to use uh, the cloud factory simulations uh, made by Rowan. And um, so, okay, so that's, that, that was the idea, no? So let me go back to the momentum equation, in particular for the students. Uh, this is the momentum equation. You have on the right-hand side of the equation, you have the forces uh, that enter in your, in your problem. And on the left-hand side, you have the accelerations. So what this means is that whatever you have as a cause, as a physical cause, the force, uh, the gravity force, the force of uh, the pressure gradient, it produces an acceleration, okay? So in the left-hand side are the accelerations. If you, this equation, multiply it by x, by the position vector, and then integrate all the terms in volume, then what you get is the, 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 what, what we call the, the VR theorem. And here is the, the, the VR theorem. In particular, in this, I, I wanted in this case to keep the kinetic energy on the left-hand side because it doesn't come from any of the causes. The kinetic energy comes as, as well as the, as the, the time, second time derivative of the moment of inertia. They both come uh, from the consequences. So somehow the kinetic energy is the consequence of whatever you have caused. So in this sense is that I, I believe that kinetic energy cannot be used as an argument of something that is supporting the cloud because it's the consequences of, of whatever forces you have in your problem. So this is for you to keep in mind. However, in this work, I'm just going to focus on the gravitational term. The gravitational term is what the, the gravitational force multiplied by the position vector and integrated in volume. Okay, so let's keep this, this term over here. And let's see, well, we have this, this simulation, we have clouds and we can identify clouds at different levels of the density. And what will be the, the gravitational potential? Okay, typically what people do is to, um, to say, well, let's imagine that our cloud is isolated and then that the, the, the isolated cloud uh, has only its own gravitational potential. So this is what enters into the, into the gravitational potential. If you put this here and make some algebra, you can show that the gravitational term becomes the gravitational energy. But this is for the case, in, this is only in the case uh, that the cloud is isolated. In reality, the cloud is not isolated. It, it has another clouds around and, um, and actually it can be in a large complex, which may be relevant for the, for the energy budget. And so you have to add the gravitational uh, potential of the external mass. And also then you cannot say longer anymore that W is equal to the gravitational energy. You have to keep it separated. 
both the gravitational energy mass, the external uh, stress will give you the total gravitational content, content of a particular cloud. Okay, so let's keep this box over here and let me put it in, in parentheses and let's uh, hold on a little bit. So now let me talk a little bit about the real parameter. The real parameter was defined by Bertolt diaz maki as the two times the kinetic energy over the gravitational energy, okay? So uh, somehow what people think is that if the gravitational energy is equal to the kinetic energy, then the cloud is in balance, okay? And uh, typically what we used to do for, for this EG is just not the gravitational energy of an irregular cloud, but the gravitational energy of a spherical cloud is what people usually do. So they, they assume that the clouds are spheres that have some typical size and the, that the density is constant. So all these approximations do matter for, for whatever you, you, you get later. So, but in principle, still what people uh, think is that these turbulent motions that, uh, that produce this kinetic energy balance somehow the gravitational energy. That's what we used to think uh, typically. However, as, as I shown in, in other uh, talks, as, as clouds contract, then the gravitational uh, energy becomes more or less two times the value of the kinetic energy. So virial balance actually is, uh, is, could be very well the result of collapse itself. But that, that's not the point right here. Just wanted to, to talk to you about that. So, uh, so the point here is that if you have a, the real parameter being smaller than two, that means that the gravitational energy is larger than the kinetic energy, okay? So that will give you uh, whatever uh, value you get over here for the real parameter. That will mean that the gravity is dominating. Okay, so but this, as I told you, is the gravitational energy in the, the, the definition of the real parameter is using the gravitational energy of an isolated cloud and typically it has to be spherical. What if instead we rec rec recover this from, from the parentheses and, you, and we use the, the total W? So instead of using EG, we use W. So that will include the, include the tides of, of, of the galaxy, of nearby clouds, of whatever. So to get a feeling of what this means, Let's, uh, let's draw here the real parameter, uh, the value of the real parameter. And typically in the typical definition, uh, what is in the denominator is the absolute value of the gravitational energy. So alpha is always positive. Now, if you release that and you instead of, uh, write W, W can be positive or negative. So to, to, to show you that, uh, that this is the case, let's think in a, in a toy cloud you uh, here for this toy cloud, uh, I have represented the force vectors with, uh, with these blue arrows and the velocity vectors with these green arrows. And it's supposed to be turbulent. So they are pointing anywhere. So um, for, the, for the force, uh, for the force uh, vectors, what you have is that this cloud ha is within, uh, has, has a, a particular uh, gravitational potential and so uh, if you have a negative gradient of the, of, the, of the potential, then the force, which has this minus sign that I took out here from the, from the integral, the force is positive. So the, the force point to the right. On the, on the other hand, if the, if the gradient of the, of the gravitational potential is uh, positive, then the force is negative and it points the other way around. So if, the, if your potential has a concavity pointing upwards, then the cloud should be uh, uh, being compressed. Um, if it points on the other side, uh, if, if the concavity of the gravitational potential points downwards, then the, 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 the gravity should be tearing uh, apart the cloud. So uh, here, let me, let me show you then what happened in the different cases. In the case in which the, the absolute value of W, which I am assuming here is negative, uh, is smaller than the kinetic energy, then we have 
that the kinetic energy overwhelms the gravity. And this is the typical case in which people argue that the clouds are, are uh, supported by, by, by turbulence. Now, we can have also positive tides. So the cloud is being disrupted. We have the positive concavity. And then the, the cloud is being disrupted. But anyway, the kinetic energy also was uh, tearing apart the, the cloud. In the middle, we have the cases where the gravity wins. In this first case, uh, alpha is negative, but it's between zero and minus two. And the uh, gravity is, is compressing, and it wins over the kinetic energy. On the other hand, here, we have that gravity wins, but wins for tiring up the cloud. So it, it will, it's larger than the, than the kinetic energy, but still is tiring the cloud. Yeah. Just to see if I do what's these two effects of the cloud is disrupted is because of the local environment. Basically. It could be. Javier, the, sorry. Uh, it, Javier, uh, yeah. could you repeat the question to the uh, online audience, please? Yeah, yeah, yeah. thank you for, for, for letting me know. So, uh, Jacopo is asking if uh, in this uh, right hand side uh, uh, cases, if we have disrupting clouds, and if the, in these cases we have a contracting clouds, yes, that's, that's the case. Uh, we'll see now whether it's tight because of the galaxy or, or because nearby clouds or whatever. Okay? It's so external. it's, well, actually, I'm not making the difference, it's the total. So, of course, you, don't, you cannot have something that is tight uh, because of the internal mass. It, it has to be external, yes. On the other hand, for compressive tides, it could be either way the, 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 that the tides are compressing but also that the mass is strong enough to, to, to keep the cloud, no? So yes, as, as uh, Jacopo said, on this side, we have the compressive tides, on this side, we have the disruptive tides. Okay, so uh, we took the simulations by row one, we made a zoom on a particular region that had been resolved with very high uh, resolution, like a 0.5 or 0.2 parsecs, I believe, within this, a large scale galactic uh, cloud, um, a galactic uh, model. So, and the potential, the ingredients of the potential are, of course, the, the gas itself. Uh, uh, so, we have not only the gas of each cloud, but also the gas of nearby clouds. We have also sinks because at some point the cold cannot longer resolve the gas, and we put sink particles. These sink particles can be thought as massive clouds or massive small clouds or also can be thought as a large stellar clusters. So we have these things, uh, those are an artifact of, 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 the, uh, of the numerics. We have, since, since we are computing uh, the, the, the energies in the frame of reference of the cloud, then we have to account for the centrifugal force because our frame of reference is moving around. So this box that you see here is moving around the galaxy and then we will have centrifugal forces and Coriolis forces, and we have to, to include them as, as part of the effective potential. On larger scales, we have the stellar disk that, uh, that, that we have, uh, that it, it has some influence. We have the stellar spiral arms, we have the stellar bulge, mm. and also we have a dark matter halo. Okay. So at the end, the W, the final W, the total W will be, will be the sum of all these terms, okay? The halo, the bulge, the disc, the arms, the centrifugal force, the Coriolis force, the gas, and the sinks. Okay, so as for the disc, here we have the uh, W of different, uh, the different parts of the galaxy as a function of the total W. So this is the identity line. So if some, uh, some of these elements have uh, points over here, then that means that it's dominant, that effect. So what you can see is that the disk, uh, the, the, the energy in the rotational content of the disk over the cloud is, is not uh, important. It's like four orders of magnitude smaller, if not, large, if, if not more. Uh, as for the bulge, this is the middle, the middle panel, is also not relevant, and the arms are also not relevant for the energy body of, body of the cloud. Okay, on the other hand, uh, or on the same hand, the, ball, the, the halo, the dark matter halo, is also not relevant. 
So the first conclusion of this work is galactic tides do not matter for the energy budget of the clouds, of molecular clouds, okay? This is important. Not all clouds, but molecular clouds. This is consistent, first of all, with estimations by Michalas and Ruthley back in 1969, but also we have made some estimations uh, back in uh, 2012 or Jog in 2013 may, uh, using uh, some sort of uh, gene instability for uh, including an external uh, galactic potential. However, although this result is consistent with, with these works, it seems to, to, to be weird with a Colombo et al. results because what they found is that apparently where you put your cloud in the galaxy uh, defines the properties that you observe the cloud. So the, 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 the clouds, the, the properties of the clouds depend on the position of, uh, in the, within the galaxy. We'll get back to this point later. So now let's, let's keep going. So as for the Coriolis force, you can see that for the larger clouds, it's not so relevant. Although for some few small clouds, this is relevant as well as the centrifugal ground force. Mm -hmm. So local, local forces due to the centrifugal force and the Coriolis force may be relevant in some cases, although it's not the, the general case. Uh, and finally, the stars, or sorry, the sinks, which will be the newborn, newborn stars or more dense parts of the clouds. And the gas, they do, uh, they uh, both account together, this is the sum of they both, uh, account together for the total gravitational content of the cloud. So basically the, the total gravitational content of the cloud depends on the gas, but it ha you have to include the tides and the, the more dense gas and or stellar clusters uh, that are nearby. Um, Okay, so the conclusion, the second conclusion will be that the dense gas or the stellar cluster, which is represented by sinks, and the gas itself do matter for the energy budget of the clouds. Now, we wanted to compare W against the EG, the, the gravitational energy of a sphere, uh, that, which is uh, what most people use uh, basically in, in, in the literature. So, here you have the ratio W over EG. So everything that, we, if, if this ratio is larger than one, then the, your cloud is dominated by tides. So the, 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 the W is larger than the gravitational energy of a sphere, of a homogeneous sphere. So you can see that in, in our simulation, 75% uh, of the clouds have larger values of W compared to, to EG. So basically what this is telling us as a third conclusion is that we typically underestimate the gravitational content of molecular clouds when, we, uh, when an observer gives you, this is the value of the gravitational energy. Well, this probably is underestimated. Now, then uh, we wanted to compare the new VR theorem and the old VR theorem. Sorry? Parameter. <laughs> okay, so um, so in the case of the via, of the classical via parameter, we got what most people uh, found, found. Although uh, most people found even more extreme cases, we found that most of clouds have via parameters larger than two, which means that the cloud will be supported by turbulence or gravity will not be important. No, uh, we found almost 50-50, although a little bit more. Uh, of unbound clouds. People typically found 60, 70% of clouds that are not bound. Uh, this is not our case, but, but still is in the same line. If you, instead of compute the classical VR parameter, we, you compute the full VR parameter, then the, 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 the case is the opposite. Most clouds are dominated by gravity. 70% 70, 70 of the clouds are dominated by gravity and only 30% of the clouds are dominated by turbulence. So the fourth conclusion is that typical studies find that gravity is less relevant than what is it is when you consider the full gravitational potential. Uh, we then um, want to, uh, to stress that the real parameter accounts for positive and negative W. So, and this is, has no parallel with the classical parameter. With the, the classical real parameter only has positive alphas because you take the absolute value of the gravitational energy of the cloud. And here you can 
you can have positive and negative values. In this case, these are 30% of the clouds. In this case, these are 70% of the clouds in the total population. And you can see that indeed there are different values of the real parameter. Uh, so some clouds are dominated by gravity and contracting, some clouds are dom gravity dominated, but are disrupted, etc. Okay, so as a corollary, something that we can think here is that if you have that gravity is staring apart the clouds, then gravity, the global gravity of the galaxy, can be important to contribute to what we call turbulent motions. And this is uh, relevant because we have insisted that probably the collapse itself is contributing to turbulent motions. Well, yes, but also if the cloud is being turned apart by, by, by stresses, then uh, gravity can contribute to the origin of, of, of turbulence. So uh, to tell you about the, the, the statistics of our clouds, what we found, well, we have here again, the alpha real axis, and we have values of uh, smaller than minus two, between minus two and zero. This is our gravitationally dominated, as Jacopo pointed out. These other cases are gravitationally, uh, sorry, are, are still apart. Uh, these are uh, between zero and two and larger than two. So we found that half of the popula population is bound. Is bound, bound. It's, uh, the, the tides are compressing, and turbulence cannot overwhelm it. On the other hand, one fifth of the population is tidally disrupted, is unbound, but because of tides, not because of, of turbulence. Then 17% of the population is really what we used to think is turbulent supported. I mean, the, the, the gravity wins, sorry, the, 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 the gravity is compressing, but it doesn't win, wins the, the turbulence. And finally, 13% of the clouds have um, are expanding, but no, are expanding not uh, really not because it's, um, uh, gravity wasn't pulling away, uh, pulling inside, uh, but we're, we're, we're being tied apart. No, okay. So and then the other thing is that seventy percent of the clouds are gravitationally dominated. So W is relevant. You have to account for that. So. Um, and I think I already say that, that 66% that of the tides are compressive and 34% of the cloud have disruptive tides. So now getting back to, to, to the large scale galaxies. So if galactic tides like uh, dark matter, ball, uh, halo, bulge, uh, disk, and arms do not contribute to the, to the energy budget of the molecular clouds, why we have these large scale patterns in the galaxy? Why we have spiral lines? Why, why this, the, the clouds are aligned with all these structures? Well, um, um, as I told you already, Colombo and collaborators found that molecular clouds properties depend upon the localization of the cloud in the galaxy. So the, the clouds in the spiral arms have different properties than the clouds in the interim regions or the clouds inside that, that, that was studied by, by, by Dario Colombo. And also, for instance, uh, Liu and collaborators recently have published a paper in which they found that tides are important in this galaxy, NGC 4429. So why, why this is so? Well, I believe that the answer is the following. Molecular, of course, at, at the level of molecular clouds, uh, what we're finding is that galactic tides are not, are not important. However, the molecular clouds are not alone. They are formed by larger scale streams from H1. And these streams do matter about galactic tides. So you can show, uh, I'm not going to do it up here, uh, but you can show that if the density is not that low, if you have densities of, of H1, then galactic tides can be relevant. Um, so yes, uh, for, for, for the H1, galactic tides are relevant, are important. And then if the H2, if the molecular clouds form from the H1, then they will inherit the morphology of the, of the H1. So it's, it's like, it's not important itself on the cloud, on the dense cloud, but it was important before it was a molecular cloud. Okay, um, additionally, I have to say, I, as I told already, uh, in the model that we made back in 2009, the orientation of the cloud was relevant for the energy budget. I, I already told you that. We model uh, some ellipsoids.
si estaban, oh ya, yeah. que eh, Osvaldo was asking if uh, the clouds uh, in the bar were perturbed by the by the bar itself, no? So yes, actually you can see that for the, in the bar the, the clouds uh, are aligned along the bar mostly, typically, no? You can see these these streams coming in into the center of the cloud, and yes, this bar is moving fast. And, and typically, the, in, inside the bar, in, in the bar zone, the tides are huge. We did not compute uh, anything uh, in the, uh, around the bar. Uh, we, are, we were focusing in this work, we were focusing 8.5 kiloparsecs away from, from the center of the OK? I don't know if I should continue with my own audio or? Because it was only the audio, no? Or? I don't know. Uh, well, and people cannot see us, but... Uh... But they can see the presentation or not? Yes. Okay. So then getting back, uh, I was about to finish. So uh, let's see. Where did I... Donde me quedé? I was over here. And I was saying, well, uh, you know, the... Um, yeah. So we were talking about uh, why the spiral galaxies have different shapes and why molecular clouds are aligned with these shapes if both galactic tides don't seem to be important. Well, it's not important the tides for the for the for the molecular gas, but it is for the H1. And then since the molecular clouds are formed from the H1, they inherit the already uh, obtained shape. Uh, what I was saying with this is that back in 2009, we showed that depending on the orientation of your cloud, the tide can be compressive or disruptive. You have this cloud here and, uh, and you put it over here, then the internal parts of the galaxy try to, 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 to the, I mean, the, the cloud tried to, to, to go faster and the, and the external part of the cloud, the, the, the farther away part of the cloud goes slower so that tears up the, 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 the cloud. So it depends on the orientation. And this is relevant because if you see the, the results by, by Colombo and collaborators, um, you see that uh, indeed you may have some clouds that are I align almost radially and other clouds that are more aligned along the spiral line. So of course that may change the uh, what you have, uh, uh, the, the properties of your cloud. Uh, I think that in a more dramat dramatic case, the work by Liu uh, that I was talking about uh, before, uh, they analyze this NGC to uh, 49, uh, 44 to nine galaxy, uh, the internal part, uh, this blue part here is the is the molecular gas uh, that they observe, and um, what you can see here is in this galaxy you have many clouds that are radially aligned, and of course he gets uh, for these clouds he gets that the tides are really important. Uh, however, I won't be too too excited about this result because if you look at this galaxy, this is an, an um, SA galaxy, if not a, a S0. And so the spiral arms are very, very um, tight. So that may, uh, what, what this may do is that when you try to find clumps or clouds here, you may be mixing material from one ring from, into the neighbor ring, and then your cloud looks radially aligned, while for just from the morphology, it seems that this is not the case, that the, that the gas is really uh, um, um, spiraling uh, in big circles. So I won't be excited by this, but what I want to stress is that the orientation of your cloud is important. And of course, they are finding that it's important because they have these this aligned clouds along the radii. OK. So the fifth conclusion is that you have to be careful with your clump finding algorithm. So finally, another interesting result is that uh, Ganguly and collaborators uh, used also simulations similar to ours, although not the same, uh, and they were looking at the uh, force vectors uh, of clouds to, to see whether the tides could be relevant or not, and they found exactly the opposite result. So they found that tides of the neighbor in the neighboring gas is not relevant. So this is completely the opposite uh, result. So 
my take of this is that in their simulations, they, do, they do, don't, don't have the whole galaxy. They just have one kiloparsec squared, and they don't form these big, huge complexes that we have. So they, if you have a cloud within a big complex, then probably the tides are more relevant than uh, if you don't have them. So probably that's why they don't have uh, the same result of, of, of we. On the other hand, they don't do this calculation. What, instead of doing this calculation, what do they do is to compute the orientation of the force vectors. And they try to say to, to show that statistically speaking, most of the vectors point in the direction of the local of the of the gravitational potential of the gas itself of the of the cloud but and that the and that the total gravitational force i mean the, the, the force due to the external gas is not that uh, relevant so uh, so there is discussion about that uh, is i'm not saying that our result is the the final one but uh, in principle I do think that the first uh, point uh, may, be, may be relevant. And the other is that we are computing different things. Okay, so as a conclusion, tides are relevant for the, for the molecular cloud energy budget, but not galactic tides. Um, gravity is more important than what we typically think, and gravity may pull, pull out the molecular clouds. Um, so finally, galactic ties may not be relevant for molecular cloud budget, but they are relevant for H1, and the molecular clouds are formed from H1. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Javier. We will start with questions from the auditorium. Um, if possible, right. please, uh, after every question, 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 Javier, if you could repeat the question, that'd be great. Thank you. No. Uh, Jacopo. Jacopo. Uh, so, from an observational point of view, mm -hmm. uh, do you uh, do you know of any result that shows that actually molecular or star forming region molecular clouds uh, have different properties, uh, like as a function of the galactocentric distance? Yeah, I think that uh, there is a lot of controversy. I mean, I, there's people that say that yes, there's people that that find that it, it is not. For instance, we have here, um, how was the name of this, uh, who was in church of the of the, of the Pulita Bridge? Um, um, really? Yeah, no, no, La Chica Estavantes. Ah, yes. Uh, oh. Yeah. <laughs> Primo Caldu, that's her Anai name. Caldu. Anai, Anai. So, Anai. Uh, made a study of several galaxies, and they found that there is no dependence of many properties, velocity dispersion, star formation rate, and whatever else. On the other hand, you have Columbus results. There, I think also Hughes, Charlie Lada, Charlie Lada the, he has, it, yeah, he, Charlie Lada, I think that he, he finds that it's not uh, relevant. Uh, both Hughes, uh, collaborator of Colombo, arguing in favor of, of, of yes, made has also some results arguing that yes, that, galactic, that the galactic environment matters. So there is some controversy. I think that there is not a final answer on this. I could comment on that I, uh, because it, it's interesting. It depends if if molecular clouds are just a an operational definition because you're defining them in terms of what you observe, which is the CO, for example. Uh, so at most, it could depend a little bit on metallicity, but once but once you have gas that is appropriate for the SCO to shine, which is probably already collapsing, then maybe they should not depend so much. That's how I read, for example, Charlie Lara's talk uh, from a couple of weeks ago. That uh, it's a molecular clouds are just our way of selecting one chunk of the gas, you know, because we're selecting them by our, our observations. So, so, mm -hmm. so in that sense, I would think that it's because you're selecting gas with some property, but then those properties don't change, right? Because, uh, <laughs> right, it's because of your selection method. Okay, so you say that once gas is collapsing and you can observe it, mm -hmm. then all the properties like uh, homogenize. More or less. Yeah. yeah to Although I won't say the same in the case of the inner galaxy, no? I mean, the bar really can make difference. No? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
So do we have, I, I don't know. Online questions? Questions on online. Oh, here is a, a ah, sorry, Thomas. Come on. Yeah. I was wondering about this uh, revised uh, virion parameter that uh, you mentioned earlier. Uh, that you show which include more terms. Has it been tested and measured in observations also? The, the new VR parameter? Yeah. No, no. Uh, Thomas is asking for the online people. Thomas is asking uh, if uh, the, real, the new VR parameter has been measured observationally. Uh, that's your question, right? No, the problem uh, with, the, uh, with the, the new VR parameter is that you, don't, you have to make some estimation for the external gravitational potential, and, and that's not straightforward to do. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's a challenge, no? So how how you can or could estimate the gravitational potential of nearby clouds? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Online questions? We yes, we have a question from Gilberto. I Hi. think that Sundar is talking, but I cannot hear him. You can can you hear me? Blah, blah, Gilberto blah, blah, is blah. talking, but also I can blah, hear blah, him. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Hear so, that. okay. Uh, <laughs> blah, 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 blah. Uh, Gilberto, Gilberto, perhaps. Oh, the chat, we cannot hear you, Sunda. Ah. I don't know why. Yeah, neither Gilberto. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we can, I can try to call you, <laughs> guys. Uh, yeah. Just... yeah, it's supposed to. Ah, right now it's <laughs> okay. Blah, okay. Blah, blah. Yeah, now we can hear you. <laughs> You can hear me now. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. So, I have two comments. Yeah. First, uh, I will argue that you're underestimating the gravitational term because, well, not you, but the simulations, because your lack of resolution, well, no, not lack of resolution. When you reach the resolution level, you're going to have a constant density, and that is going to have a lower gravitational gravitational energy than something that is picked inside your resolution element. So the code by the nature is going to give you less uh, gravitational energy that it should. Not the type, but the, the internal gravitational energy. So that is going to give you less bound structures than there should be in reality. Yeah, just by the Eulerian nature of the code. Yes, I, I agree with that comment. Uh, although I have to say that most of our clouds have sizes between two and ten parsecs, and the resolution is about 0.2 parsecs. Yeah, but so, if you but but you can have a lot of gravitational energy in uh, binary systems inside your resolution element. So how much energy you can have in binary clumps or binary cores? That's a I have no idea. Yeah, but in but principle, it, that energy will be accounted uh, for because of the sinks, isn't it? I mean, we have sinks, and then you once have you ha the mass is there, have and if the sink, sorry, if the sink is inside some particular uh, clump, then it accounts for that, for the self-energy of that uh, structure. Once you have collapsed, yes, but if you have fragments, unresolved fragments, you can have a lot more gravitational and energy there. But maybe that's another, we can discuss that later. I okay. had another comment, if I, if I may. Um, yeah. the, in Rowan Smith's simulations, they do not have a live stellar disk, isn't it? The spiral arms are a potential in both. Yes, I think it is not live. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, I, that, that's for sure, it's not live, yeah. Because one of the things that Barbara Pichardo used to say is that in her potential, the arms are narrower and the force that generate is asymmetrical between the inside and the outside of the arm. So having sinusoidal arms, even if they are narrower, they are going to give you less tides than it should. Okay, that's a good point. Fair enough. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay, thanks, so, uh, Rosita and Christian have yeah. questions. Yeah, so Rosa will go next. Hola. Hola. Bueno, maybe I didn't understand anything, eh? <laughs> but it's been known for me, for a long, long time that SA galaxies with a very small star formation have a lot of molecular gas, and then. 
I think it was at the beginning of the pandemic in May 2020. We had, I think this is the one talk, but I'm not completely sure, by Timothy Davis. And he showed that the, the, the clouds looked very, very different in SA galaxies and in SC galaxies. They were very, very, very small. And uh, yeah, there were a lot, but their structure was completely different. So how do you explain that? Well, the, I agree with that. I mean, uh, the SA galaxies, my impression is that they have larger uh, dark matter halos. They are rotating, statistically speaking, they are rotating faster. And that smears your, your clouds along these, these, uh, these arms, which are much more circular than the typical spiral arm, no? So, so, so the pitch angle is, is, is uh, smaller, no? So uh, my, my point showing this, this galaxy that I showed you, this SA galaxy, was that you, you go, by just making a clone finding al uh, algorithm, you may merge different uh, rings no, of, I, I, I of molecular clouds. So, but of course, uh, it also, it's, it's, it's statistical. I haven't seen it, but I'm not an expert on extragalactic studies. But at least judging from the papers by, by Kenny Cote, I will say that the SA galaxies has less star formation rate. And I think that that's because of tides. OK? Now, our galaxy is not an SA galaxy. It's, uh, it's meant to reproduce the properties of the Milky Way. OK, so although I have to say that we have some rings. <laughs> so anyway, uh, but what I want to say is that at least our results will be applicable, not maybe to SA galaxies, but to SB or SC galaxies like, like Milky Way. No? Uh, so I agree with your clone finding thing completely. Mm -hmm. But then I didn't understand what you mean by the halo has no influence, no? Because now you are reviving the halo and you're telling me that because of the halo. Well, yeah, okay, I, I, I'm trying, maybe I'm being too, pushing too much the result, no? Yeah, maybe if you have a more massive halo, which we couldn't test, no? If you have a more massive halo, then the rotational velocity will be larger. And then, of course, the influence of your tides necessarily will be larger, yeah. So, yeah, the, bro, that's that's a best uh, a better way to to phrase it. So you Thank you. The effect, is the, the, the effect is not that the halo affects our clouds in our galaxy, but it may, it may be affecting the halos of more massive halos may be affecting other clouds. No, yeah. Okay, I don't know. Maybe it would be nice to to sort of enlarge your parameter space to yeah. try to. Understand yeah, uh, yeah. You also can. I mean, at least uh, if you made the, the simple calculation made by Michalas and Rutli, you can show that that this is the case. Indeed, if you have larger velocity rotations, you you have the, 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 your your structure will be less bound. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Bueno. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Rosa. We have a final question from uh, Christian. I cannot hear him. Is it me? <laughs> no, I can't hear him either. So it, it must be something on his side. No. OK. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you can write me if you want, Chris. Yeah, Chris, if you like, you can uh, type into the chat uh, right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, he's not. Okay. No other questions. I wanted to know which way are you defining the clouds? Okay, what we made uh, since this was uh, made with a repo that, and, and the mesh is regular, what we de did is taking density thresholds. So whatever is above some threshold and, and is connected, then that's a cloud. Mm -hmm. Good. OK. OK. Any other question? Well, OK, thank so, you. Thank you, Javier, again. Thanks very much, Javier.
All right, everyone, that's it for today. Um, ah, Rosamelia has, I know, she's clapping. <laughs> <laughs> have a good afternoon, and we'll see you next week. We have uh, two talks, one on Thursday and one on Tuesday next week. See everyone. Okay, two Thanks talks next week, guys. Oh, well, yeah, Bye. Bye. Bye.